Ladies and gentlemen, one of my heroes, Mr. Steve Lindmeyer. Give it up! thinking, oh, this is, I, I shouldn't go in because this guy's doing a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, I guess I just sit here. Yes, sir. It should be turned on, ready to go for you. Hello. It does work. Are you, are you like moderators? I am, uh, I'm your moderator, yes, sir. I, I'm a mobile mic stand. Oh, okay. you're going oh, to be with these yeah, guys? Yeah, I'll walk out there and... I'll get the hang of it. Just give me time. <laughs> Welcome to Knoxville, sir. It's good I, to have you here. I am extremely happy to be here. Is there anybody here who's actually a... I know what Tennessean is, but Knoxville, I don't know how you say it. Knoxville people? If you are, raise your hand. Oh, quite a few. Yeah, okay. I'm a fellow Southerner originally from Atlanta. So nice to be here. <laughs> it's good to have you. Welcome to Fanboy Expo. It's good to have you Thank here you. as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I don't know what we're supposed to do. We're going to talk and do questions. It, it's Q&A. It's story time. It's your show. Well, let's do that because um, I can. I, I find it more interesting to listen to what you guys would like to hear about instead of me rattling on. So, I don't know. If, if anybody has questions, why don't we try that and that'll be your stories for me if that works for you guys. That's great. That works. I, I got a question right over here. This gentleman right here. I've got the mic. <laughs> What is the funniest thing that has happened while working for uh, Sesame Street or Muppets? I don't know if you worked on Fraggle Rock. I did. Oh, you did? Wow. But yeah. uh, anything Dark Crystal for that matter? The anything. funniest thing that ever happened. God, there's so many. I have to tell you that a lot of it has to do with the work, but part of it came from the fact that it was the same group of people for such a long time. You know, we had our little core group of puppeteers and the people who build the characters. Uh, and we were really like a family, you know, a family of choice. And we traveled all over the world doing this work. <clears throat> and one of the things we always did was play a lot of practical jokes on each other. <laughs> Particularly, it started as this tradition with Jim way back, with Jim Henson. I, I assume most of you know who Jim Henson was. Mm. And um, we would scare each other a lot. Like, it could be as simple as, you know, hiding behind a door and jumping out and saying, ah, you know, somebody jumps. We did some really elaborate ones where people, uh, my wife and, and uh, actually, believe it or not, the executive producer of the Jim Henson Hour and uh, myself played a joke on Dave Goles, who does Gonzo, in the, um, the parking garage of the Sutton Place Hotel in Toronto, big echoey concrete place. So we went up one morning, like way before Dave, and, and we, could, we knew where his car was, but so I'm hiding behind the car, and I think my wife was, in another spot, kind of covertly, where she could just see him when he walked out. And Karen, my, my friend Karen, was over here. And we were like, and I got the signal. Just as he put the, he's whistling, he's having a great morning, there's nobody around. He walks up, he puts the key in the door, and we jump out. And we got it all on videotape. <laughs> so, you know, of course, we could embarrass Dave a lot. There's, there's a million different stories like that. And, uh, but that, but really and truly, the stuff behind the scenes is some of the funniest stuff, whether it's with the characters or with just the fun, you know. <laughs> Long answer, but but we, it, it explains a lot about the Muppets that it was the same group of people for such a long time. All of those people were very close with Jim, and Jim gathered this sort of core group around him of people that he wanted to spend time with um, as much as anything. And of course, he, we had to work, but it was a lot about that group of people he wanted to spend time with. So lots of memories and lots of fun in that department. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> how did you how did you get your start into puppeteering? Like, what made you fall in love with that? Um, it was really the Muppets themselves, because um, I was never that interested in any other type of puppetry. You know, string puppets. I had marionettes when I was a kid, and they were just always a mess and tangled up. And my mom would have to try to. It was a mess. I, I had no luck with that. I wasn't coordinated enough to make that work. <laughs> and um, you know, I mean, there are different kinds of puppets. The Muppets is one style. Um, and then Jim took that particular style and really refined that to work very well on television. Um, and that's what appealed to me as a kid. I remember the Muppets from the time I was a little kid, a little tiny kid. You know, Rolf was on the Jimmy Dean show back in the early 60s. And uh, I was a little guy and just like to, asked to stay up late to watch Rolf, you know. And I knew it was a puppet, but I was fascinated by, you know, this, the, how it worked and it seemed so alive and so real. And, as Sesame Street came along when I was about 10 years old, 
I realized that those characters, not only were the characters amazing and so alive and, and consistent every day, the same people, you know, doing these characters year after year after year, but it looked like the guys doing it were really having a lot of fun, you know. So I, uh, I kind of wanted to be a part of that. And so, so my inspiration for puppetry was really Jim completely. Um, you know, it was all about the Muppets for me. And that's done. Yeah. Question right away. <laughs> so the Muppets are really known in a lot of productions for music. Is there a particular musician you've enjoyed working with, and do you have a favorite Muppet song? Wow, there, well, there are a lot of musicians, obviously, that we worked with over the years. I mean, I, let me just preface that by saying I, I came into the Muppets in 1978, so that was, you know, more than 40 years ago at this point, right about 40 years. And most of that 40 years was all exclusive with the Muppets on various projects. You know, Fraggle Rock, Dark Crystal Labyrinth, all those things, too, uh, working with Jim up until he died. And so every week on The Muppet Show, I mean, I was 19 years old when I started this, which was amazing. I was this kid who'd never worked in really professionally before, but I'd been fiddling with puppets for 10 years at that point. And so every week, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on The Muppet Show, and, and I walk in, and there's a new celebrity for the next show, you know, this, these famous people that I grew up with as a little kid. Um, and many of them musicians, but really the, some of those classic Hollywood actors like Danny Kaye and Bob Hope, and, the list goes on and on and on, you know. Just getting to work with those people as though you're just one of their peers. You know, it wasn't like I was this guy standing on the side. I'm in there I'm simply working with these people. And Jim was great about including us in that work. Um, you know, I was the new guy, but but nobody knew that. But the Muppet guys, I mean, as far as the celebrities are concerned, I was just one of those guys, you know, at 19. You know? Um, my very first thing I ever did with the Muppets was the Alice Cooper episode of The Muppet Show. <laughs> yeah. So, you can imagine this. You know, I'm 19 years old. I've been in, like, these long-haired rock bands in the 70s and in my high school doing Alice Cooper music. And then I get to go to London, and the first celebrity I meet is Alice Cooper. So that was a pretty big deal. Um, and we, we've run into each other many times over the years. And I understand I'm going to be at the Raleigh Comic Con coming up in North Carolina. He's going to be there, too. So. I'm hoping to reconnect after. We've seen each other maybe 15, 20 years, so, you know, I'm gonna try to see him again. So that's a favorite because it was the first one. Um, John Denver was really special to us. We did a, we did a lot of work with John's albums and, uh, and did several TV specials, and of course, The Muppet Show. Um, just an incredibly nice guy. And one of the most talented singers I have ever heard. When you really, you know, these days, there's little light boxes that tune people up when they're out of pitch. I use one of those sometimes. Um, but back before that existed, you could stand in a studio while John was singing, like he's singing into a microphone and you're sitting right here, and everything was perfect. I mean, that man had an incredible voice. So I'd have to say that's one of the real favorites. <laughs> yeah. Out of everything that you've worked on, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, Muppet Show, yeah. what what has been your favorite? Well, I have to say my, my real favorite thing probably was Fraggle, uh, Fraggle Rock. Yeah, it, it, it's a, it was an amazing little show that came along at a great time in my um, sort of growth and development as a performer. Um, it was at a stage when Jim wanted to go off and sort of focus himself on things like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and those new projects. And it was almost as though, this is not the total thing, but it's almost as though he set that series up so all of us could be working on something and getting better at it while he was developing other projects. Um, so, for those of he would come in and do a couple of characters once in a while, but basically he wasn't in Toronto as we were shooting that. So we all really grew as performers, you know, we, we, had, we were sort of on our own a bit. And uh, Wembley was just, Wembley Fragger was basically just you know, me. <laughs> he, he would, I mean, it, you know, it, it turns out that when Jerry Jewell, who was the, the conceptual guy, the head writer behind that show, uh, when he and Jim and, and all of them put these, this group of characters together, evidently we find out that those characters were written around the performers, which is a very smart thing to do. And so, you know, Jerry was, you know, going to sort of be the, the senior puppeteer, so Gobo was the, you know, uh, Dave was, you know, could be a little bit, uh, a little bit booberish, a little paranoid at times, in a good way, if there is a good way. And uh, and I was this, 
you know, young 20-something guy who was just, couldn't make decisions, and I had this hummingbird sort of uh, metabolism, you know, and that's what Wembley was. So the energy that's in that character was just my enthusiasm over the work. Uh, so that was my favorite, by far. Yeah. Awesome. Got a question down here? First of all, uh, your version of sh uh, with Sean Colvin for uh, I Don't Want to Live on the Moon oh, yeah. on my mixtape for the drive up here. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so, um, that was fun. That was, oh, yeah. Anyway. Um, curious about the development of characters, like yep. when you first get felt sure. and it suddenly <laughs> becomes a character, yeah. uh, the amount of time that goes through the struggles of the back and forth, especially considering the number of years that you've done this. Yeah. Um, how often do you just look at a blank canvas and right. go, I can do something amazing with that? Yeah, well, you know, it happens in a lot of different ways. And, and you're kind of acknowledging that as you ask the question. Um, sometime there is a puppet that's already created and you look at some feature about this puppet and you sort of say, well, I think, you know, you might have a big underbite, so you might go, you know, or he's got a certain facial expression or, or he looks afraid, like, like Beaker looks afraid all the time. So there's yeah. Beaker who's afraid all the time. Um, and of course, I didn't originate Beaker. A different scenario is, is if you sort of step into the shoes of another performer who is really responsible for this character, like Kermit or, or Ernie or Beaker. Um, a much different thing, because the important part of that is <coughs> it's very easy for a character like that to just become uh, a stilted copy of the performer who did it previously. Um, it's all too easy just to copy what that person did and the problem with that is you might sound like them and you might move the puppet like them that it might look right but there's but you lose the depth of the character and all the Muppets I think the real secret of the Muppets is the depth of those characters um, Frank is sort of famous for having done this you know multi-page document about who Miss Piggy is and where she came from it's like a whole biography or maybe it's an autobiography. <laughs> um, but but he, he knows who Piggy is, and, and, there, and the audience will never know any of this stuff. But in order, as an actor, which is really what we're doing, is just acting through these characters, um, that stuff's important to us. I don't know that it's important to all puppeteers, but it, it was always important to me, and I guess that's something I kind of picked up from Frank. So to assume a character, I think it was very important in my case to have known Jim and Richard Hunt and any of the others that I had to step into. Otherwise, I don't think it's really possible to be faithful to those characters and then allow them to continue to grow. Because if Kermit was exactly the same as he had been when Jim passed away, we would have never done the Christmas Carol at Treasure Island. Jim had not used Kermit in ways like that. So we had to let him, let him grow a little bit. It was just incredibly important to me for him to stay based on what I knew of Jim having been around Jim. Um, so that, that's super important. And then sometimes one of us will open our mouth and some silly voice will come out occasionally, and then the puppet gets built around the character. Bill Beretta is quite infamous for that. Uh, a character like Pepe the Prawn, if you know who Pepe is. Um, that's a character that Bill sort of walked in with and picked up a puppet. And it, it wasn't a prawn, it was just this voice he did, uh, based on his sister's, I'm sorry, his wife's uh, aunt, I think. Anyways, <laughs> I won't tell Bill's story. You can hear Bill tell the story. <laughs> but, uh, so it comes from all different places. And, and then as the characters grow and develop, you get that from people you see on the street. When I first started doing a character like Rizzo, he's supposed to be this kind of sort of tough-talking, sarcastic New York rat. And I was a, a, like a 20-year-old kid from Atlanta. So I didn't know anything about a New York tough-talking person. Um, and it took me five or six years to really even get where he had a New York accent. Yeah, you know, I didn't know how to do that. And Jim, that's the patience of Jim, though, because he let me grow into that instead of saying, no, no, you do it like this, you know. <laughs> Next question. Yes. Uh, you were talking about Jerry Jewell and the yeah. writing and everything. Um, I've noticed Frank Oz has been talking on Twitter about how Disney seems to be reluctant to yeah. let actual Muppet people get involved with the creative process. Now, I don't know if you're allowed to mention anything about this or not, but is there some sort of legality or contractual issue that Disney can't bring in people like, say, Jim Lewis or Joey Mazzarino to do any of the writing? No, and in fact, uh, Jim does a lot of the writing. Jim is very involved. And Joey has been involved too. Um, <clears throat> Joey was working on it, and Joey also, Joey Mazzarino, if you don't know who Joey is, is uh, 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 I think of him as young because I was there when he showed up. He's, okay, he's an old guy now. 
<laughs> Not as old as me. Uh, Joey is one of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, and Joey is, was the head writer of Sesame Street for quite some time and a very talented performer as well. So he knows what the puppets are like from the inside out. Um, but no, there's no reason. There's no reason. Jim, Jim writes a lot of what the Muppets do. Now, Jim, Jim sort of chose not to be a part of the last series we did. He had a choice. Uh, and he was busy with other things and, and just his family and living his life. Uh, so he didn't get involved in that. But there's no legal reason why he couldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. So, that, you know. He's around. Right. Jim, Jim's still involved. Okay. And Kirk Thatcher is another one. Right. You know, I don't know who Kirk is, but you can look him up on the internet. Kirk is a great director, been with the Muppets a very long time, very talented person, and he writes and directs Muppet things as well. Okay. Got a question back here? Yeah. What was your most favorite thing to do as a puppeteer, and what was your most favorite character to play? Thank you for asking that question, Nicholas. I happen to know Nicholas personally. He's a good friend of mine now. Uh, <laughs> My favorite thing to do with the Muppets or as a Muppet character? There have been a few of them. I, I, my favorite project was Fraggle, but the question's a little bit different. Um, and after, you know, it's been a lot of stuff. I mean, 40 years is, was a long time for that. One of my favorite things ever, and this is just one of those things, you know, we meet these people, meet big celebrities, but I got to do the, the Queen's Jubilee birthday, like the Queen of England, right? And you don't always get to meet the Queen of England. That's pretty amazing, Queen Elizabeth. And you know, that was, so that was very cool. That was a number of years ago. Kermit had an extremely small little part of this giant show at Buckingham Palace. And I'm just this guy, nobody knows who I am because I'm inside a frog, nobody knows that. But we got to sit there through like Paul McCartney's sound check and Ozzy Osbourne, and, so you get to see all those people. And, uh, but then, you know, you meet the Queen and you, and you have to do that right, you don't just say, how are you? Yeah, first, first the protocol is you address her as your majesty. I mean, you, you do this. This is like the way it goes, you know? And then after that, you can refer to her as ma'am. And, uh, but, but she's very forgiving about this stuff. I, I met her twice the first time. I was so nervous that I was gonna screw it up. I did screw it up. <laughs> she comes down this receiving line. There are other puppeteers. She, and I happen to be one of the first people in this long line of performers at a, at a World Command performance. So she comes down the line. She's wonderful lady and she, and she reaches she offers her hand and I I'm taking her hand you know and I said uh, it's a pleasure to meet you you're ma 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 majesty <laughs> I got ma'am and majesty mixed up and she and here's what she did she went like it's okay it's okay you know very I, I love her I think she's great so that's pretty special um, I'm gonna stick with that one <laughs> another question right over here sure Not all of it if you don't want to, but is it okay if you can go to the next question in Ernie's voice? You know what? I, I would love to be able to do the voices for you. I'm not going to do the voices. I'll tell you why. Because I'm not doing the character anymore, and I think it's the wrong thing for me to do to come in and do the voices. Um, I, there's a new puppeteer doing Ernie now, and technically that person needs to be Ernie. Uh, I feel really strongly about that. Um, these characters are extremely individual. And, and the secret to their, in my opinion, their connection to the audience is their individuality. And um, so I want to respect a new puppeteer stepping into those things. Uh, it's an impossible thing to do. The, the, the new puppeteers stepping into certain characters really didn't know Jim. Um, so there's, there's a lack of Jim's influence there. And I just, I, I think I shouldn't overshadow that particularly. Um, so. I don't mean to, to not do what you ask, but um, it's fine, don't worry. I understand. you understand. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes. Another question over here. I was curious, I've been hearing rumors of possible uh, Fraggle Rock movies yeah. coming up. Could you talk and see if that's, is that going to happen? Are you involved in it? Well, I don't know much about it, and I haven't been involved in any of those talks. Um, and it's been talked about for a very long time. Uh, there's, I, I, I can think of, it's like 10 or 12 years that there's been some little thing out there in the press about a Fraggle Rock movie or something about the Fraggles. Um, so the real, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, but the last thing I heard was two or three years ago they were, they were trying to still develop it. Um, I guess it just hasn't quite happened yet. Um, I have personally have mixed feelings about it because I think the show is so special that I would hope that if there is a new version of it, it meets that, that sort of standard and that expectation. Um, and it was a very special time, as I said, you know, 
this particular, it, it was interesting, this particular group of people at a very particular time in the 80s, it was an interesting era, and the show was created for a purpose. Jim, Jim walked into a meeting, and you, some of you may know this, and he basically sat down with a few core creative people. I wasn't among that group, these were the producers. And he said, my goal is, he didn't know what Fraggle was, I want to create a show that will end war. And the point was that there were these groups of characters that learned to understand each other. You know, the Gorgs and the Fraggles and the Doozers and then Doc with Sprocket, you know. And that, of course, it didn't really end the war. But, 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 but you start out with a goal like that and, you know, you're headed in a good direction, you know. Uh, so I hope the values that were in that show will exist, you know, in the expect further expectation of it. That's awesome. Got a question over here? Um, since Jim's passing in 1990, what would you say is the biggest, like, positive or amazing uh, thing that you have noticed with the direction of the company? Wow. Um, well, the fact that they're still around is pretty amazing. I mean, you, you, most of you probably know the Muppets are now owned by Disney. Uh, it's not the Hensons. The Hensons are not involved with the Muppets at all at this point. Um, so, so the franchise is kind of split up in a different direction. Sesame Workshop owns all the Sesame characters. Kermit was a crossover. Uh, Disney owns all the Muppet Muppet Show characters. Kermit, Piggy, Fozzie, Gonzo, and then the Hensons still own things like Dark Crystal. Uh, Labyrinth and Fraggle Rock. So they're different universes run by different people with different ideas about how to do things. Um, but I, all I can say is that the most positive thing I can think of is that there's still longevity to these characters that began under Jim. And the fact that that's even possible to still exist is pretty amazing. Now it comes and goes, and, and we've, even throughout my time with the Muppets, we, the popularity of the character is up and down and up and down. There'd be long periods where, you know, nobody knew who the Muppets were, and then we'd do something and maybe not again. Um, but there's a real spark in there, a real spirit that, that, that continues to hopefully push them forward. You know? And, and I, I feel like that is something that Jim instilled in his people that he surrounded himself with, and I, I feel it. Um, and, and, and a big part of what I always tried to do was you know, find a, a, a reasonable way to share that with the fans because that's the point, right? Uh, is that is that hopefully you guys pick up on something that too. Awesome. And we got time for one more. Uh, there's an actor I think never gets enough credit, and since you got to work with him on Muppet Treasure Island, what was it like to work with Tim Curry? Yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> The, the back story on Tim Curry is that, um, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you the story, it's going to take a minute, because it's, it's my story, but his story. Uh, I was a massive Rocky Horror fanatic. And so yeah. I'm like down there, on, you know, my wife and I are down there on Friday and Saturday night for both showings at midnight and two in the morning, dressed up in the whole nine yards with the stuff and throwing it. And we did the whole thing, like every weekend for years. Then when I got to London, I'm doing the Muppet Show, and I suddenly realized, wait a minute, this is where they shot Rocky Horror. I'm still 19. So I went about uh, trying to meet every person who had a part of Rocky Horror, like from the, you know, all those names on the credit. And I met Richard O'Brien, I spent, because it's a long story, I won't go into that. Um, he's a terrific person and we kind of got to know each other a little bit. Um, and then suddenly we're working with, with Tim Curry on this film. In the meantime, you know, he put out a couple of great record albums in the, in the 80s, I guess. My wife and I had gone to hear him sing when he came through Atlanta. He let us, uh, we were allowed to go backstage. I just said, I'd like to meet Tim Curry kind of thing. And I had gotten a picture of him playing William Shakespeare from the same studio where we shot The Muppet Show. And, and we had this long talk about it and he signed it for me. So fast forward 20 something years, he shows up to do this film with us and I'm trying to be not a total geeked out fan, you know, <laughs> yeah. at that point. And I don't want to be playing opposite, so I don't want to make a fool of myself. Um, and Brian Henson says, uh, we're walking across the studio a lot. I've just met Tim Curry. We did a read through of the script. And Brian says, Tim, I think Steve is really not, he's holding back. He's not really letting you know what a big fan he is. And Tim said, really? I said, yeah, you know, I'm a pretty big fan. So our dressing rooms were next to each other. And during, I don't know if you guys know this, on films, you spend a lot of time sitting around waiting for lighting and stuff. So hours would go by and he'd knock on my door and sit down and we'd talk and I'd knock on his door. And before we started shooting, he agreed to go out to, I just invited him out to dinner. So it was me and four or five other of the performers, and we just went out and had a very informal get to know each other dinner outside of the context of the film. We got all the Rocky Horror stuff out of our system. 
he loved that film. It's just he got so typecast that he was trying to do other things. And I, I love him. He's a terrific person, and um, I'm glad he's still kicking. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have. Don't forget, stop by his table, please, uh, get please. some autographs, take some pictures. He's yeah, got a ton yeah. of other stories. Uh, so one more time, ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.